come and speak at the conference and to um, talk with you. And I'll hope, I hope that um, we can keep my part in this short enough so that we can have some back and forth at the end of it. But it is an honor to be here at the Gandhi King Conference. It's an honor to be on the same stage, at least for a few moments, with David Rowicks. And I hope that he can come back and um, sing with us. Another very, very committed artist and social activist. Um, so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to talk about immigration policy, like it says up there on the screen. And I'm a photographer um, and a writer, both. And so I'm going to show you photographs while I'm speaking. And you kind of have to multitask a little bit and um, look at the images and um, then listen to me, I guess. Um, I hope that you can see them pretty well. I don't know if it's possible to get the lights dimmed a little bit more on the screen there. Well, at any rate, we'll just do our best. And also, uh, uh, you can see that there are captions there, so if you're sitting way in the back or off to the side and you can't see the captions, you might want to move. Okay. Well, we all know that there is a big economic crisis in our country today. Um, I live in California, our unemployment rate is 12.5%. Um, I don't know what it is here in Memphis, but I can guess. And I'm sure that everybody here has your own um, way of looking at what the impact and the results of that crisis are for people in our communities. Um, but, you know, this crisis obviously isn't something that's just happening to us or people in this country. Mexico is in a deeper crisis than we are. You know what they say in Mexico is that when the U.S. catches a cold, Mexico gets pneumonia. So that gives you an idea of just how severe it might be there. Um, for immigrants in this country, especially indigenous people, and by indigenous what I'm talking about are people who were living here um, on this continent, speaking languages that were a thousand years old before Columbus ever got here. Um, for immigrants in this country today, what economic crisis is translating into are attacks. I was just reading in the Spanish language paper that's being handed out in the gymnasium over there about Shelbyville and the police stopping people and um, on whatever pretext, you know, broken tail light and all of a sudden somebody winds up in the back of the police cruiser or a van and pretty soon they're in a privately run detention center and they're being deported. Um, I think that we all have heard about the laws that are being passed, the one in Arizona and now the two ones in Alabama and Georgia that essentially say that the police are going to stop anybody that looks Mexican and um, hold them for deportation. Schools have to ask kids now whether they have immigration documents. People can be arrested for giving a ride to somebody who doesn't have any papers. Um, and this is not recent. You know, Mississippi passed a law two years ago that said that if you don't have any papers and you take a job in Mississippi, you work for a living, and after all, we're supposed to be a country that respects work, that um, you can go to state prison for five years and pay a $10,000 fine. Um, this link between economic crisis and political crisis and then what happens to immigrants as a result isn't new in this country. In the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of people were put on railroad cars, mostly in the southwest and the west, and taken down to El Paso and just dumped across the border. Anybody that looked Mexican, you didn't have to be Mexican, you could have been born here, but if you spoke Spanish and you look Mexican, that was enough to get you deported. Um, but deportations and waves of deportations are not um, always just the product of economic crisis in this country. The year that we had the most people deported from the United States was 1954, when the United States deported 1,054,000 people. Um, that was also the year that the United States imported about 400,000 people from Mexico in the Bracero program. And so the deportations of that year were an effort to force people to only come to the United States as Braceros. So if you didn't have documents, you were taken down to the border, and sometimes those same people were then re-brought back across the border to work for growers 
as contract laborers then we had a another wave of deportations in the late seventy's and early eighty's that were essentially being used as a way of convincing working people in general and especially congress that immigrants were the source of unemployment and people's lack of jobs and that the best thing to do was to pass a law that said that if you were undocumented it was a crime to work in the united states and that is exactly what congress did in 1986 they passed a law that said that um, it was illegal for an employer to hire somebody without papers and it was illegal for a person without papers to work well when i look at my own work starting with the work that i did for a long time as a union organizer, and then today as a journalist and as a photographer, um, I think that I see sort of two purposes to it. One is that it's important for us to have a reality check. In a time of hysteria, the way we have it today, um, we need to show the migration process as it really is, which is the migration of communities of people and the creation of new communities here um, in the country that people are going to. But second also, um, I think that the function of somebody who works in the media like myself is to strengthen the movements for social justice. I know that that's not what they teach you in journalism school or in the newsroom at the New York Times, but I believe that that is what uh, an important function of somebody who is a writer and a photographer. Um, so let's start with the first reality then, which is enforcement. Um, we just heard from Janet Napolitano Department of Homeland Security that the United States deported 396,000 people last year. That's the highest it's been for a long time. I know it was a lot higher than 54, but that's certainly um, higher than it's been for you know at least the last 20 or 30 years. Um, the year before that, we deported almost that many, 380 some odd thousand people. Last year. 356,000 people spend at least some time in a privately run detention center. That's kind of a euphemism. What is a privately run detention center? What is its real name? Prison, right, jail, jail. So how do people experience this kind of wave of um, enforcement? Well, here's the experience of a man named Jose Guzman, who was picked up, or who was not picked up, but who was um, involved in an immigration raid at the Nebraska Beef Meatpacking Plant in Omaha. He said, the day of the immigration raid, the Negro was waiting for us in the lunchroom. I saw them rounding people up, so I moved a bench and I climbed up into an air conditioning duct. Every time they opened the door, I felt sure that they were going to find me. I couldn't move or make any noise, and I was like that from 10 a.m. until evening. And during those hours, I thought about my wife and my family. I'd filled out my application to get all of them documents, and if the media had taken me, it would have ruined all of that. I thought of all my hopes and my dreams ending there. From the moment I saw the media, I thought, everything is over. Thank God I escaped. Four years ago, the ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, their agents raided the agro-processors meatpacking plant in Postville, Iowa. And there they detained 388 young people, um, almost all of them indigenous people from Guatemala. And they took them to the National Cattle Congress. And I love that name, because it just tells you how, how we're looking at people. It's a livestock showground in Waterloo. And there they built a makeshift courtroom. And those young people were brought in chains before a judge and a prosecutor who had agreed what was going to happen, what plea agreements these people were going to be forced into five months before the raid ever took place. In other words, five months before they even knew their names, the judge and the prosecutor had agreed what was going to happen with them. So these workers, they had given the company social security numbers that they'd either invented or that belonged to somebody else. And so the judge and the prosecutors, they told them that they'd be charged with aggravated identity theft, which carries a two-year jolt in federal prison. Um, but that if they pleaded guilty to misusing the social security number, they would just serve five months in prison and be deported immediately afterwards. You can imagine what they chose. Well, one of them was a young man who was beaten with a meat hook on one of the production lines in the plant by a supervisor. And we know about this because ICE told us 
in an affidavit that they filed with the judge to get a warrant for the raid. But once the raid took place, that young man was picked up and then he was imprisoned and he was deported along with everybody else. The supervisor, what do you think happened to the supervisor? He went on working. Women were released to care for their children, but they couldn't work, so they had no way to pay rent or buy food. In fact, if it hadn't been for St. Brigitte's Catholic Church, whose parishioners collected money and food and found those women and kids a place to live, they would have been out on the street hungry and homeless. Now, since the end of the Bush administration, immigration authorities say that they're going to follow a softer policy. So instead of raids, the way I've just been describing, they'll implement a system for checking the legal status of workers, which is an electronic database that they call E-Verify. So people who are working with those bad social security numbers are going to get fired. Well, two years ago, 2,000 young women working on sewing machines in the factory of American Apparel in Los Angeles got fired. Um, 1,200 janitors got fired in Minneapolis a year and a half ago. 600 people working at the Chipotle restaurants got fired. 475 janitors in the, um, San Francisco, where I live, got fired. One of them was Teresa Mina here. And so here's what happened to her. She had lived in San Francisco for six years. And for those six years, she couldn't see her kids that she left behind in Veracruz because it's so dangerous and expensive to come back into the United States that she couldn't afford on her salary to go back home and see them and then come back here to go back to work. So she tells the story of how she got fired. She says, the woman in the office wouldn't pay me until I showed her my immigration papers. She said that the papers I had when I was hired, and remember she'd been working here for six years, she said the papers I had when I was hired were no good. I told her I didn't have any other papers. I asked her for my check for the hours that I'd worked on my vacation, and she wouldn't give me anything unless I agreed to sign a letter saying that I was quitting my job. I finally said that I'd sign it so that I could get my check, but I felt really bad. After so many years of killing myself in that job, I needed to keep it so that I could keep on sending money home. She says, this law is very unjust. We work night and day to help our kids have a better life or just to eat, and my children won't have what they need now because I can't work. Well, you know, ICE these days, Janet Napolitano, John Morton, they say that they're, they are auditing, going through this process, of auditing the records of 1,654 companies nationwide. So we can expect thousands more workers, in fact, hundreds of thousands of workers, to get fired as a result. So let me ask you, what kind of economic recovery is it that goes along with firing hundreds of thousands of people? And these raids, and these firings, and this E-Verified database, these are really all means to enforce that section of immigration law that got passed in 86 is called employer sanctions that said that for the first time employers had to check the immigration status of workers and therefore made it a crime for those workers to work. Now you know they say, especially the Republicans, when they're pushing for even more enforcement, they say, oh, well, you know, sanctions were never enforced because employers never went to jail. But hundreds of thousands of workers got fired for not having papers. We don't know how many, because nobody keeps track. Those folks just simply don't count. And ICE says that this kind of enforcement is targeting employers who pay illegal workers substandard wages or, enforce, or force them to endure intolerable working conditions. I love the language. Well, curing intolerable working conditions by firing the people who are enduring them, well, it certainly doesn't help those people and it doesn't change the conditions, and that's not who ICE is targeting anyway. Teresa Mina was making a good wage because she belonged to a union, SEIU Local 87. Those janitors in Minneapolis, they had a union too. They were making more money than non-union janitors in Minneapolis because they had had to strike and fight in order to get those wages. So really, ICE is punishing undocumented workers who earn too much, or who, demand higher wages or who try to organize unions. And despite the notion that enforcement is punishing those employers who exploit illegal immigrants, they say, those employers get rewarded for cooperating
by firing their own workers, by being immunized from prosecution. So really, this policy only punishes workers. Even more important, this kind of enforcement has a big impact on the ability of people to fight for social change. Now, some of you might have heard about the big organizing drive at the Smithfield plant in Tar Heel, North Carolina, because it went on for 16 years, the longest running organizing drive in modern labor history. Well, in that drive, in 2007, there were two immigration raids and 300 people got fired for not having those papers, which made everybody so scared that that union drive stopped for a year. But then the Mexican workers and the African American workers in that plant, they found a way to make common cause. And together in 2008, they won the union election and they brought the union in. And what was that common cause? They said to each other, we all need better wages and conditions and we all have a right to work here and to fight for them. Two years ago, three years ago, ICE agents raided a Howard Industries plant in Laurel, Mississippi, and they sent 481 workers to a privately run detention center, and get this, Gina, Louisiana. You remember Gina, right? That was where they uh, punished African American young people who um, objected because white students, high school students, had hung nooses from a tree in the middle of the town. Well, Gina is now the main, the main source of employment in Gina now, is one of those privately run um, prisons for immigrants. Anyway, Patricia Ice, who's the attorney for the Mississippi Immigrant Rights Alliance, says that this raid is political. She said, they want a mass exodus of immigrants out of the state. The political establishment here is threatened by Mississippi's changing demographics and what the electorate might look like in 20 years. This is Jim Evans. Jim was a pro football player and then a player rep for the NFL Players Association. And today he's the AFL-CIO rep in Mississippi and the head of the Black Caucus in the Mississippi State Legislature and the founder of the only immigrant rights in the organization I know of here in the United States that was organized by African Americans. What Patricia Ice is talking about is that African Americans are moving back to Mississippi from the north and now make up about 35% of the population of Mississippi, which is the highest percentage of African Americans in the population of any state here in the country. Well, in 10 years from now, immigrants are gonna make up another 10% of that population. So MIRA, the Mississippi Immigrant Rights Alliance, and the Black Caucus in the legislature, they have a plan, which is you combine those votes with some progressive white folks and with some unions, and you can get rid of Trent Lott and the power structure that's governed Mississippi since they were there. So then what was the purpose of the raid? That raid was intended to drive a wedge into the heart of that political coalition to stop any kind of possibility for change. I think one of the worst indictments of the way our media covers immigration is that it so rarely asks what the purpose is of the kind of stuff that we see in Shelbyville or Laurel or Postville or in our own communities, this kind of enforcement. Who is benefiting from it? Well, we do know that immigration enforcement doesn't keep people from crossing the border and it doesn't prevent them from working. We have 12 million people in this country who have crossed that border in one way or another and who are here without papers. And so to understand why, we have to understand why it is that people are coming. And that requires another reality check. So here is Emilia Juan Antonio, who talks about her husband leaving Guatemala to go to work in that meatpacking plant in Nebraska. She says, Lorenzo had to migrate because we had no money and he had no job. When he left, we owed a lot of money at 15% interest. Farm workers here only earn 20 quetzales a day. That's about $2.50. And our debt was 75,000 quetzales. So he wasn't sending home much money at first. And there were times where I didn't have enough to buy what I needed for my kids. But now we only owe 10,000 quetzales. It's sad because our men are very far away and we are here with the kids. Thank God Lorenzo and I really understand each other. He cares about me 
and I care for him. Lorenzo says that if he doesn't leave, we will not have a very good life. There is nowhere here that he can make enough money. I know he has to leave, it's true. But sometimes I ask God why I have to live like this. Maybe it's just our destiny. Sometimes my husband will be with me and sometimes he won't. Maybe this is how we'll live our lives. But I pray to God that Lorenzo will come back well and that someday we'll be able to live together. Indigenous communities like these people in the mountains in Guatemala and like the people coming from southern Mexico, these are the most recent arrivals here in the United States. And what it's telling us is that displacement, in other words, the forces that are pushing people out of those communities are reaching into the most remote areas of Mexico and Central America, people, again, who are speaking languages that were old when Columbus got here. Those communities are also doing something else that's very important, which is that they are challenging the system that produces migration. They're developing the concept of the right to not migrate. In other words, the economic development in Mexico and Guatemala should give people choices. It should make migration something that's voluntary rather than something that's forced by poverty and desperation. Juan Romaldo, who's a high school teacher in Oaxaca here, he says, migration is, is a necessity, not a choice. There is no work or a future for young people here. He's talking about Oaxaca, where he lives. Gaspar Rivera Salgado here has a unique organization with roots in the indigenous communities in Oaxaca, but also has chapters among those migrants who are coming from those communities here in the United States. And he says, we want immigration amnesty and legalization for undocumented migrants, but we don't want guest worker programs. We need the right to work, but with labor rights, not slavery. And at the same time, we need development back in Oaxaca that makes migration a choice rather than a necessity, the right to stay home. Both rights are part of the same solution. But the right to not migrate has to mean more than the right to be poor. The right to go hungry and homeless, choosing to stay home, only has meaning if it can provide for a meaningful future. Well, what is the reality in Mexico right now? This is the mine in Cananea, one of the world's largest copper mines just south of the border with Arizona. And miners in this mine have been on strike for four years to stop a multinational corporation from eliminating their jobs and busting their union. The Mexican government brought in the police a year ago to try to bust up that strike. And if those miners lose that strike in their jobs, well, the border is only 50 miles north. So if this was you and you had your union busted and no job to support your family, where would you go? Now, two years ago, the Mexican government sent in the army to all the power plants in Mexico City and fired all 44,000 workers in order to destroy the union there as a prelude to the privatization of the electrical generation system in central Mexico for the benefit of wealthy foreign investors. Well, again, where do you think those 44,000 people are going to go? If this was you, and you had no job to support your family, and you got your union busted, where would you go? You know, these miners and these electrical workers, they're fighting for the right to stay in Mexico, for the right to stay home. This is Gemma Pacheco here, and he was a miner who lost his job in a previous strike in Cananea in 1998. He says, they put me on a blacklist and they said that I'd never get a job anywhere in Mexico after that. I had no alternative but to leave Cananea to look for work in the U.S. I didn't really want to leave, but there wasn't anything else I could do. My children and my wife are still in Cananea. We talk on the phone but I'm hoping next year I'll be able to bring them. I don't think I'll go back to the mine. That part of my life is over. These are not just terrible stories about people's personal experiences. These folks are trying to tell us something. They're trying to help us understand the way that large economic forces that are unleashed by trade agreements like NAFTA and immigration laws like that one from 1986 are affecting people's lives. They're telling us something fundamental that you're never going to read in our press or see on TV, and that is that our trade policy and our immigration policy 
are inextricably bound up with each other. They're like two sides of the same coin, part of the same system. You know, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, it produced migration. The first year it went into effect, 1994, Mexico lost a million jobs. Since 1994, six million people from Mexico have come to live here in the United States. Why? Well, one reason is that NAFTA let huge U.S. corporations, Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, Continental Grain Company, sell corn in Mexico for a price that was lower than what it cost farmers there to grow it. Well, those corporations, they get huge subsidies from us. Our last farm bill paid them $2 billion. At the same time, that agreement said that Mexican farmers had to do without the subsidies that their government had had up to that time, that those subsidies were illegal. So anybody who tells you that it created a level playing field, uh-uh. So as a result, people are now coming from Mexico's most remote areas again, where people have been farming that corn. In fact, Oaxaca, Mexico, is considered the place where corn cultivation originally started thousands of years ago. Mexicans were promised that free trade and cheap corn would at least keep food prices low. But now the price of tortillas is three times what it was when NAFTA passed. And that's great if you're Grupo Maseca, which is the Mexican corn and tortilla monopoly now. And by no accident, Archer Daniels Midland sits on its board. And it's great if you're the largest retailer in Mexico, which is who? Who's the largest retailer here? Who's the largest retailer in Mexico? Walmart. Same company, right? But if you can't afford to buy those tortillas, then you go where you can. Well, they said that an economy of maquiladoras, in other words, those low-wage factories on the border, and those low wages would at least produce jobs, but today, hundreds of thousands of people just right across the border in Juarez and Matamoros and Tijuana and Mexicali, those folks have lost their jobs because when the recession began here, what it really meant is that we stopped buying what those factories were producing. And when those factories stopped producing for our market, those workers lost their jobs. Well, the wages of the workers in those factories are so low that even when people are working, this is how they live. Cardboard houses made out of scrap, Dirt roads, no sewers. You know, this is, it, it takes half a day's labor in a maquiladora to buy a gallon of milk for your kids. And that's what life is like when you're working. So when you lose your job and the border is just a stone's throw away, what do you think people are going to do? Where do you think they'll go? If it was your family and you had no food and you lost your job, and this is where you lived, what would you do? I don't think there is a single person in this room that can tell me that you wouldn't do whatever it took for your family to survive. We all love our families. But that's why it's so hard for families to survive now. Those low wages, you can't farm, you get laid off to cut costs, your factory gets privatized, or your union gets busted. So. NAFTA produced migration. It didn't end it, it produced it. That was one of its most important functions. Because that displacement of people, it creates a mobile workforce, a reserve army of labor here that's indispensable to our economy. There are 12 million people in this country who don't have any papers. And there's maybe another 26 or 28 million people who have visas or who become citizens but who were born somewhere else. So if everybody went home tomorrow, what do you think would happen? Who would pick those strawberries? Who would work in those meatpacking plants? Who would clean those office buildings? I'm not saying that immigrants are the only people at work, and I'm not saying that immigrants are willing to do the jobs that no one else is willing to do. I think those kinds of ideas put us in competition with each other. But what I am saying is let's get real. The labor of all of us is important to the functioning of this economy, not just some. And to employers, our employers, this migration is a labor supply system, and for them it's not broken at all. It's working pretty well. Because first of all, it's inexpensive. 
What do you think the average wage of an undocumented worker is? What's the minimum wage? Yeah, eight bucks an hour maybe, right? Let's be nice to employers and say they're all obeying the law. So that's 12 million people making minimum wage. Well, you know, the average wage in this country for working people is about $16 an hour. So that's a big difference. Multiply it out. 12 million people times 2,000 work hours a year times $8 an hour difference, that's $80 billion. That's a subsidy if there ever was one. So to those companies, the strawberry growers, the people who own the office buildings, the meat packers, do you think that they pay for the needs of the workers, families, and the towns that people are coming from? Who is it that pays for the school in Oaxaca where Juan Romaldo was teaching? Who builds the homes? Who pays for the doctor, although a lot of times there isn't one? Those growers and those building owners, they don't pay for anything. In fact, they don't even pay taxes. They certainly don't pay taxes in Mexico, and a lot of them don't pay taxes here either. So, who pays for all the things that those towns need in order to produce more workers to send them north? Well, the workers do. Mexicans working in the United States, some of the poorest workers in this country, sent back last year $20 billion. That was in a recession. A couple of years before that, before the recession started, they sent back $30 billion a year. So the structural adjustment policies that are imposed on Mexico by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and these reforms, what they do is they tell countries like Mexico or El Salvador or the Philippines, the countries that are sending migrants out into the world, that the government budget for social services has to be cut. Sound familiar? Same rule that they're telling us now too. So those remittances that are being sent back by workers, that's what pays for whatever social services there are in those communities. So it's a very cheap system. Here, immigrant workers, they pay taxes, they pay social security like everybody else out of their paychecks, but they don't get what those are supposed to pay for, the disability, the retirement, the unemployment insurance. These are things that, things that working people fought for and won here in the New Deal. But for people without papers, the New Deal, it just never happened. Here's another reality check. Pogoro Vega here, who lives outside of Salinas, says, there are 10 of us living here in this trailer, and we pay $1,200 a month in rent. The landlord only wants seven people living here, but because it's so much money, there are 10 of us. It's cheaper that way. But if he knew that there were 10 people living here, he would charge us about $1,600 a month, actually, if he found out that we were secretly letting three other people live here, he would evict us. In the next trailer over, there are 13 people living there and he charges them $1,800. So people are living in camps, they're even sleeping in the fields. You know, when these photographs have gone around California and they get shown in farm worker towns, a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, I remember, I slept there too, I lived there too. These are part of the experience of many, many, many people. Another one, Bernadina Diaz here. They all live, she and her four daughters and son live in one bedroom in a house in Oxnard, California. She says, we pay $500 and an extra $50 for gas to use the kitchen, and we take turns. When one person is done, then the next person starts to cook. 13 people live in the house. We're all from different places. Every year we go to Salinas, which is about four hours away in a car, for four months, but it costs us $60 for our ride, $360 for all of us. We sometimes take up to a month to find a job because we don't own a car and we have to walk from place to place. So any money we save here, we use up there to eat while we're looking for work. Still, she says, we live better here because at least we have food to eat, and in Mexico that wasn't always the case. My daughters, say that my biggest accomplishment was bringing them here. Well, you know, people in this country believe, many people, I speak as a union organizer, having spoken in union meetings and talked with lots of people, many people in this country believe that if we lost those jobs, that we lost because of NAFTA, when we saw factories close down and those jobs moved south, that if we lost the jobs, well, Mexicans must have gained them. And if Mexicans got those jobs, what are they doing here? They must be greedy. 
trying to game the system and get welfare. You know, we can see what the real causes of migration are if we talk to the people who experience it. And is it just us? Is this just something about the US and Mexico? There are 200 million people in the world who are living outside the countries that they were born. And they're not just going from Mexico or El Salvador or the Philippines to the US, but from Turkey to Germany, or from Jamaica to the UK, or from the Philippines to Japan. Who here has a Manu Chao's CD clandestino? If you're one of the cool people, raise your hand. Oh well. Well, go get it. Go get it. Because he's singing about all the illegal people of the world. And if all of these illegal people were living in one city, it would be 15 times the size of Los Angeles. So let's go back now and ask again, what purpose does criminalizing all these people serve? And here are the words of somebody that our media did talk to a lot, and that is Michael Chertoff. I always thought that we should give him an award for being the most truth-telling member of the Bush administration, because he kept on telling us what was going on here over and over and over again. He was pretty open about it. He said, there's an obvious solution to the problem of illegal work, which is you open the front door and you shut the back door. What he meant was opening the front door means that corporations and contractors, they get to go to countries like Mexico or Jamaica or even Thailand, and they get to recruit people and bring them to the United States with visas that say you can only come here to work, and if you don't work, you must leave. Well, people like that never become citizens, or they don't vote, or they don't hold any power. That's pretty convenient in Mississippi, where all those casinos on the river, they need those workers, but they sure don't want them to vote. And closing the back door means you can only come if you're recruited by a contractor. So to prevent you from coming any other way, we militarize the border and threaten you with prison if you cross it or we make it impossible for you to work if you haven't been recruited in one of these programs and we send you to prison if you try. That's what is leading to this big wave of deportations and enforcement against undocumented people. And Michael Chertoff may be gone, but the policy is still here. 400,000 people deported last year, 356,000 people in detention. What are they doing there? Why is this happening? Thousands of people fired for working. Who is it that wants this policy? Who is it that's benefiting from it? And regardless of the crocodile tears you might hear in Washington from the US Chamber of Commerce, this is what the largest companies in this country want. Jorge Bustamante, who's a Mexican academic who teaches in Tijuana, he says the US immigration policy has always been about the price of Mexican labor. In history, what this has done is it has produced very organized programs of labor recruitment, like the Bracero program we had here from 42 to 64. Here's somebody who remembers what that program was like. This is Rigoberto uh, Garcia, who remembers coming here to the United States as a Bracero. And he says, thousands of men came every day. And once we got across the border, they'd send us in groups of 200 as naked as we came into the world into a big room about 60 feet square. And then men would come in masks with tanks on their back and they'd fumigate us from top to bottom with DDT. Supposedly we were flea ridden or germ ridden. Well, there was always exploitation then, he says. They would say that a bucket would be paid at such and such a price and you'd fill it up and then they'd pay less. But I was tired of being alone. That was the hardest thing, the loneliness. I missed my land and I missed my wife. And eventually I got my papers and I lived like any other person. But I always remember how I got here. Illegal or Bracero. Well, you know, we have programs that are like that today. The Bracero program ended in 1964, but today we have these visa categories like H2A and H2B and H1B, which are just really like the Bracero program. And documenting what happens to people in these programs is difficult because those workers are very often kept in guarded camps. They work on military reservations like the Pendleton um, military base near San Diego, um, where the military itself denies access to come and talk to those folks. 
so one strategy to find out what is happening to them is to go and interview them in the towns that people are coming from and that's what i did with this man this day on here who talks about what it was like coming to the united states um, and then working as a tree planter in maine and georgia he says they told us that they would pay twenty seven dollars and fifty cents for every thousand trees we planted and in the end we'd receive a check for a hundred dollars a week because they deducted the money that they said that we owed them for the equipment that we were using. We check, kept track of how much we were earning. And there you can see in his book, you know, it gives you the date, and then it says pinos, which means pines, and then it gives you the number of trees that he planted every day. So he says we kept track of how much we were earning and calculating an average of 2,500 pines daily. To our surprise, the check would only amount to $100. There was not one week when we received more than that. So we bought food with that $100, and we paid for lodging, five of us sharing a room. Well, we were eating, but we couldn't send any money home to the family in Guatemala. We were left with almost nothing. Today's criminalization programs, the raids and the firings, they're tightly tied to these kinds of labor supply schemes because essentially one purpose is to make it impossible to work outside those programs. But there's another consequence to this kind of heavy enforcement, and that is that it creates a population without rights. And the fewer rights that people have, the lower their wages get. So fear and vulnerability, they make it hard for people to organize. They make it hard to sign that union card. It makes it hard to go out on strike. It makes it hard for unions to help or represent people. And that's not new either. In fact, the use of migration as a labor supply system began when this country began. Who were the first illegal people in North America? Who were they? Thinking about being illegal. Who were the first illegal people? What do you think? What's that? Well, from the point of view of the people who are already here, and when they saw that boat coming, they looked at those people and they said, hey, where's your visa? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, in a sense, maybe those pilgrims were illegal, but really not. Because once they got here, those pilgrims had the power and the native people really didn't. So who were the first really illegal people? The ones that didn't have any rights? Slaves, that's right. African people who were displaced in Africa by the most brutal means, kidnapped and chained and marched to the coast, put on ships and taken here to the coast of North America. Why? For what reason? Labor. Labor, right. To provide labor in the plantations, but not as equal people, in fact, not as people at all. When the Constitution was adopted in this country, what did it say about slaves? I was a slave to find three-fifths of a human being, right? And that three-fifths, was that meant, did that mean that they were going to give slaves three-fifths of the rights of a white person? No, they had no rights at all. They were property. It was an accounting trick so that slave masters would get more representatives in Congress. So then we had laws in this country that defined who could be enslaved and who couldn't. That famous drop of African blood what it meant was that if there was any African ancestry, if you had any African ancestry, even going back four generations, that was enough to make you a slave. When Illinois and Indiana came into the Union, they came in as free states before the Civil War. But among the first acts that they passed in the state legislatures were laws that said that a person of African descent could not reside there. Were there no free black people in those territories at the time that those laws were passed? And if there were, did they become illegal? So these ideas of illegality, then they get applied to other people essentially for the same purpose. That's why the Chinese were brought here to work on the railroads and drain the Delta, and then why the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 created the first real group of undocumented people. And at the time that law was passed, it said that the Chinese had no right to be here. They were a majority of the population in Idaho. 
they made it a crime for Filipinos to marry women who were not Filipinas, those anti-miscegenation laws. And at the same time, our immigration laws kept women from coming from the Philippines. So for the farm workers in California and the Northwest of the 30s and the 40s and 50s, it was a crime to have a family. And many men stayed single all their lives. Why? So that they would just move from labor camp to labor camp to labor camp, working wherever the growers needed their labor. Now they say that the braceros were legal because they had visas, but they had to live behind barbed wire in camps like this. They could only go where the growers wanted, and if they went on strike, they got deported. So what I'm saying here really is that immigration policy that's based on producing a labor supply for employers always produces two things. And one is displacement, because that's what's necessary in order to produce workers. Nobody's going to stand up in Congress and say, I'm voting for the Columbia Free Trade Agreement because we need more Colombian workers in the United States. But that is what happens as a result of passing those agreements. And then inequality becomes the official policy. And today our immigration laws, with this idea, this category of illegality, with its roots in that old idea of the different status, it is reinstituting inequality in our communities. Today, if you call somebody an illegal, you're not really referring to an illegal act because it's not the border that makes somebody illegal any more than it was the middle passage that turned people into slaves. It's the status of the person that is illegal, which justifies their exclusion from normal rights and social benefits. And that status is created here. So all the bills that we see about immigration in Congress or almost all of them, share the same assumption that so basically no you even talk about it. And that is that immigrants, even people with visas, are not going to be the equals of the people in the community around them. They're not going to have the same rights, and they're not going to have the same access to social benefits. Well, I think though that media that only shows the exploitation of people and that looks at people as helpless victims doesn't help us at all. In fact, what it does is it feeds hysteria. It reinforces this stereotype that the immigrant is so victimized that he or she will work for nothing and take the job of anybody. So instead of showing the strength of communities, and we need to show, instead, I think we need to show the strength of people's communities and their value to the society around them, and especially people's ability to resist. Here's Jesus Estrada, who is a striker in California, and he tells the story of what happened. He says, all of the leaders came together and we decided to strike against the various companies asking for higher wages. Some agreed to increase the wages as long as the workers got back to work, but others fired the leaders of the strike. I was fired on that day. I didn't work for two months. Other people got jobs because they had changed their names and the growers didn't know what we looked like. They couldn't even tell us apart. Social movements are also part of people's history and tradition before they get here. In fact, migrants come to the United States with organizing skills and with knowledge that can help us, that can inspire us. You know, Mixtecos, people, indigenous people from Oaxaca, often come to California, where I live, with a history of having organized strikes in Baja California. One of them was Fausto Sanchez, who today is a legal aid worker for California Rural Legal Assistance in the San Joaquin Valley. But before he got here, he was a striker. And he says, we went on strike in Sinaloa to get higher wages. We worked seven days a week and weren't paid overtime. So we gathered all the workers together to ask for an increase in better conditions. Most of the workers took part, except for the supervisors. Those that were striking chased them through the fields with stones and tomatoes, and we locked them in a shed. That was my first time in participating in a strike, and I could see the euphoria in people's eyes when they really wanted something and felt strong enough to get it. Today there's a, re a renaissance in indigenous culture and identity in Mexico, especially in the wake of the Zapatista uprising and the reverberations and the waves of that. We can feel them in California or New York or here in Tennessee as well too. That's what helped to build those marches that we saw on May Day in 2006 and that now we're seeing every May Day since then. You know, I'm a child of the Cold War and I remember when May Day was called the Communist Holiday, right? 
It's like we've joined the rest of the world, celebrating this holiday with everybody else. So I say thank you, immigrants, for giving us our holiday back. Where does this take us? Are we actually at the end of history? Can we think of no system that might work better than what we've been describing? Isn't there some alternative to this? Part of the problem I think that we face is that if we want a more just system, that our choices get so circumscribed. And what are those choices that they get presented to us, especially in the corporate media? Well, they tell us on the one side, we've got Alabama and Arizona and the anti-immigrant hysteria, and that's the conservative option. And then the liberal option is an immigration reform that's essentially a labor supply and enforcement program. Let's look at what is being proposed as the alternative to that law in Alabama and Arizona, or at least what it is they're telling us that we can't do. So the first thing that they say that we can't do is we can't look at the root causes of migration. We can't consider what happens with trade agreements like NAFTA and CAFTA, or those three trade agreements that just got passed through Congress last week. Those we know that they increase poverty. That's what's causing the migration of people. But we're told that we can't put that on the agenda in an immigration bill because large corporations that control votes in Congress won't agree to them. Then we, told, we get told that we have to treat the flow of people coming north as a labor supply for employers with new guest worker programs where workers are going to have to keep working in order to stay. You know, the Southern Poverty Law Center calls these programs close to slavery. Then we're told that people working without papers are going to be fired and imprisoned and rates are going to increase, that we can't do anything about situations like the one that we have in Shelbyville. So we get more detention centers. You know, we forget, 15 years ago, we didn't have any privately run detention centers for immigrants in this country. And now we have hundreds of thousands of people locked up in them. Then we get told that well, we can have legalization for some people, but only some. That we're going to have barriers and huge waiting lines for many of the 12 million people who need legal status. You know, we forget, 1986, that law that I've been so critical of and saying such bad things about, it was also the amnesty law, right? And President Reagan, the most conservative president practically we've ever had, signed a law that gave almost 4 million people legal status Quickly, easily, no fines, no problem. And now we're being told that's impossible. Never happened. Well, what about change that unites people? What about change that protects people's rights and jobs and lives up to our ideals of equality? Immigrant rights groups, community organizations, unions, they're all calling reform for reform that are based on these ideals. But our media coverage doesn't look at those alternatives and is deaf to the voices of the people who want them. Who are we talking about? We're talking about organizations like that indigenous organization that got spot heads, or about the, like the Mississippi Immigrant Rights Alliance that's trying to create an alliance between African Americans and immigrants. Unions. Unions want rights for immigrants also, just so that they can organize and grow. Why is it that our trade union movement changed its position on immigration at the convention in Los Angeles in 1999. Before, if we remember what unions were like in the 80s and the 70s, they were pretty anti-immigrant. They were pretty pro-free trade, but they changed because our unions increasingly are seeing immigrants as members, as people that unions themselves need to organize in order to survive. So what would be an alternative? Well, it's not rocket science. How about stopping the trade agreements that create the poverty and the forced migration? What about giving people green cards? In other words, residence visas that allow people to work or to not work or to basically lead normal lives like everybody else. What about ending the backlogs that stand in the way of people using the existing visa system to reunite their families here in the United States? You know, if you have an adult son or daughter living in Mexico City or Manila, do you know how long you have to wait to get a visa after you make the application? There today, the people being processed and being given 
on green cards today are the people who applied in Mexico City 18 years ago, and in Manila 22 years ago. And if you apply today, because the lines get longer and longer and longer, it could be 25 years or 30 years. People die in those lines. That's like saying the door to family reunification is closed. So if we want people to come in a legal process, especially one that is designed to reinforce our families and our communities, we have to allow people to use it. Well, what about protecting the rights of all workers in their jobs and ending the firings for not having papers? We need to enforce labor standards and labor rights and union rights in this country, not immigration status at work. And by raising the low price of immigrant labor, we're going to help all working people in this country by raising the floor. And so in order to do this, workers need organizing rights, especially immigrant workers do. We have to dismantle the immigration prisons and stop the raids from treating immigration violations through the criminal justice system. What about peace on the border? Are we at war with Mexico? Why is it that we have thousands and thousands of enforcement agents, we have the National Guard on that border, we have the border that's militarized. You know, if we are worried about drug violence, let's take some responsibility for the fact that we are the market. We have to end those guest worker programs and give people visas with rights. So, is there a common ground for doing this in an era of high unemployment? Well, I think there is if we can link immigration reform to jobs. If we could convince the administration to set up direct jobs programs to reduce unemployment and job competition and connect that to immigration reform, that would be a powerful combination. And that's not my idea. That's Sheila Jackson Lee, the congresswoman from Houston, who proposed an immigration reform bill that said, let's give legal status to the people that don't have it. Let's use the fees that they pay to create job creation programs and job training programs in communities with high unemployment. Why? Simple. It puts unemployed people and immigrants on the same side, supporting the same bill. So we need to remember, what was the goal of the Civil Rights Movement? The time also when our immigration laws made the most progress. That's when that family reunification program was set up as opposed to the Bracero program. Instead of having a labor recruitment program, we had a program for reuniting people's families. That was a product of the Civil Rights Movement. So what it was based on was the idea that we needed equality, not just in law, but in fact. And not just equality of rights, but economic and social equality. And today, we need what brings us closer to equality instead of increasing inequality. So is this just pie in the sky when you die? Is any of this possible? Many groups have repeatedly called for a set of principles like the ideas we've just been describing, and many have now made a proposal for immigration changes that's called the Dignity Campaign based on labor and human rights. But change like this, like we're talking about, is not going to come out of Congress any more than the civil rights bills really did. You know, though you were a product of the social movements of this country, people on the bottom in our communities, outside the Beltway, just like Claiborne Carson was talking to us yesterday in his history of the Civil Rights Movement, that's what's going to get us these kinds of changes today. But it's not possible to win changes in immigration law just by itself if we don't fight for jobs and education and health care and justice. But these are the things that everybody needs, not just immigrants. They unite us. And if we fight together, we can stop raids and we can create a more just society for everybody, immigrant or non-immigrant. So, is this possible? You know, in 1955, you remember? What was life like here? Emmett Till got lynched in what year? 53, 54. 55, if you tried to register people to vote, in the South, what happened to you? In California, the growers had braceros and the workers had no power. And yet 10 years later, we had the Voting Rights Act. The bracero program was ended. We had a new union for farm workers that had gone out on strike and delay. No, and you know something? The same Congress members, because Congress doesn't change that much, especially in those days. The same Congress members who voted no on voting rights and yes, on Bracero's 
in 1955, voted yes on voting rights and no on Braceros in 1965. So what happened? What was it that made the impossible in 1955 possible in 1965? Simple. The Civil Rights Movement did it. People organized a big social movement that swept our country. And that's what's going to make change today, too. The social movement is going to make today's impossible. But we're being told we can't have economic justice, economic equality here in this country. It's, that's what's going to make it possible. So if we want change, we have to organize a movement that's powerful enough to get it. And is that possible? Can we really build a movement? that's going to change things in this country, that's going to give us social justice. That's what we need. We don't need a corporate program of firings and deportations. We need human freedom and equality. So we can have an immigration system that respects human rights and we can stop deportations and we can have a system of security for working families on both sides of the border. And if they tell us that it's not possible, what are we gonna tell them? She said, boy, or you know what, I think we could tell them, we are the 99%.